Hi, welcome to Steve Wraith's True Crime Interviews. And as you know, I sometimes get ex-criminals, I get people who've been involved in writing books, and delighted to welcome Ray Burdis, a good friend of mine who was uh, directed, acted um, in, in many top-class films over the years. Ray, how are you doing, mate? I'm very fine. You, Steve? Yeah, good to see you, mate. Good to see you. And um, looking forward to this, been trying to get this sorted for, for a while, but we're both busy people. And when we, when we tend to see each other, we tend to uh, have a bottle of red. So it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to be sober talking to you uh, and getting a decent interview for my viewers anyway. All right, mate. My all pleasure. right, mate. Tell us a little bit about um, your, your upbringing, first of all. Where, where were you born, Ray? I was born in Islington, um, North London. Uh, at that time, I mean, now Islington's an extremely affluent area. But when I was first brought up, I mean, I was born in Bart's Hospital, um, which was down the road in Smithfield. Uh, the Angel Islington, it was, you know, hell on earth. It's Hell's Kitchen in, in London. Um, it was where all sort of my parents were immigrants, Irish immigrants. So it's where all immigrants gravitated you know like a lot of Irish went to Camden my lot landed up in the Angel living in all these sort of tenement houses where they crammed in you know six or seven families with one bathroom sounds like I was born in a cardboard box you know but it was it was you know now I don't remember that my older brother tells me about that that you know one toilet for everyone all the families um but I loved it. I loved the area. And it was at a time, remember, when bomb sites existed. They were still there after the war. And these great, vast playgrounds, you know, fields where houses used to be, but they got bombed out. Um, you know, little street gangs, you know, as a, we were like street urchins, really, because we had nothing better to do. And, and I remember the, the area was going to be up and coming when... Um, they opened up a wimpy bar. <laughs> <laughs> we thought we've cracked it, mate. You know, Islington's on the up and up. Um, and, it, you know, I, I had a really happy childhood. Well, there's two sides to it, really. One is, um, you know, as parents, Irish drink, you know, things like that. The dad goes out. <laughs> To the boozer and they come back and have arguments. So I always remember that side of it's been pretty dark. Um, but the upside, we used to be out all day as kids. You know, we were out in the morning and it didn't matter what time you got in really, as long as it was a half reasonable, you know, half nine or ten at night. So we got up to a load of no good, you know, nicking lead off roofs and because uh, down by the canal. And we thought nothing of it. We didn't think of it as actually stealing. Yeah, we just thought, oh, if we strip that off there, I'll bring it up and get ripped off by the uh, scrap metal dealer up the road and literally get ripped off, cart loads of lead, you know, and he'd give us like two bob. <laughs> We'd run off and spend it on sweets and then look for the next place to attack. And so it was like that. It was nothing special. A lot of people grew up at, at, around our age, grew up around the same way. And, uh, you know, some people didn't, and some people use it as like um, a background story that never was. But you know, mine was. We had nothing. My parents had nothing. Um, you know, I remember sort of if I needed money for it was always for a bar of chocolate, you know, caramel or something. I'd nick it out my mum's purse or out my dad's pocket when he come back from the pub. He'd hang his coat on the banisters, and I could hear ching ching of change. Wait till he goes to sleep and then I'll go and off to the shops, you know. <laughs> so it's that sort of childhood. I'm not ashamed of it at all. I loved every minute of it. You started, way, you started acting at quite a young age, didn't you, Ray? I mean, um, that was that seemed to be like a passion of yours. Pretty similar to me. I got pushed into it by my parents at a young age because they could see that I was, you know, I, I was interested in it. And it's the best thing they did for me. But you, you was it about 11 year old you you went to drama school? Yeah, yeah and my, my parents were the opposite than yours because at that time I was useless at school I hated school even as a kid primary school so the only way I remember at the age of about 10 I worked out you know if I'm in the school play you miss all your lessons because you're rehearsing all the time and that's the only reason why I've done it to get out of lessons but I started to enjoy it 
you know. And then so teacher spotted something in me and sort of started giving me leading roles, never the lead. I never have been and never will be, but leading roles in the plays. And I took to it like a duck to water. And I remember failing my 11 plus, which was a mortal sin in them days. I mean, spell orange, you know, and I couldn't get that right. And um, when I failed, my mum was really upset because th then you, your choice of schools are very limited and whatever. But the teacher, you know, the, the, my master at the time, said to my mum, don't be upset. He'll earn his money in the acting game. Now, at that time, it was so far removed from our reality. Um, my mum didn't know what he was talking about. And then from that, I went at the age of 11, I went to secondary school, Islington Green, which was a rough old school, secondary modern thing. And uh, I immediately joined a drama group there. Don't I play Oliver? I, play, I think I played the Artful Dodger or something. And um, this woman come up to me and said, look, you, you know, you were really good in that play. Do you want to go to a drama club that I run? And her name was Anna Scher. And Anna Scher has gone on to produce, you know, Hollywood directors, direct film directors, top actors, you know. And it was all she set the drama club up was for us kids to get us off the street. So it weren't for a profit. You know, if you could afford the 10 pence, for the lesson, pay it. If you couldn't, it don't matter. You can just come and join in. Um, so I turn around to my mum and dad and say, you know what, I think I'm going to be an actor when I get older. And they were horrified. They, <laughs> in that time, I'm sure this is the wrong thing to say, but, you know, they went, all oh, actors are gay, you know. <laughs> you know I said, no, I just want to be an actor. And they were mortified, mortified. Up until someone give me a part at the age of 11 um, in one of those Saturday morning pictures. We used to have Saturday morning films then. You'd go along with sixpence and you'd, you'd get in and they'd have a band playing and then you'd show some films. So I've done a children's film foundation film. And I remember getting paid £20 a day. Now, I might be rewriting history here, but I, I think it was along them lines because that was more than what my dad was earning in a week. And that they soon changed their tune. <laughs> you know, they go, oh, son, you know, that's great. And then when I went on, you know, to get a bit older, around about the age of 16, I started writing and it, I, I wrote um, a TV series called, or co-wrote a TV series called You Must Be Joking, which was very popular at the Bruce time. Bruce Forsyth in that? No, it, no, it was, um, you know, Jim Bowen. You remember Jim Bull? Bowen, that's right. Jim Bowen, Jim Bullseye. Bowen and Flintlock, the band Flintlock. And uh, it was great fun. And then, I, I, funny enough, I had two shows out on the same day, back to back. And I always remember it, watching the telly. They used to have the presenters then in between programmes. And he goes, and now it's the Ray Burdis hour. And I, I, you know, I went, what? And the, the, the two shows back to back. So it was really popular. And my mum and dad lapped it up. They lapped it up. If you're walking up the road and people recognised you and that. So they changed, they changed their attitude. And that was the start of it, really. You really did, a, you did an episode of Step 2 and Son as well, which I didn't realise. I, I mean, did you have a... Well, was it, was it an it weird? Extra. Yeah, was it an mm -hmm. extra, was it? Yeah, you know, and at that time, you'd do anything, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> For a plan, no. Um, but you have to kind of tread the boards, if you like, do your trade and then work your way up. I was very lucky. I'm not saying talented. I'm saying lucky. Right place, right time. It was at a time when directors were sick of sort of the posh drama school types who can tap dance and speak very well. You know, it, it become a, a trendy thing to get some young Cockney urchins off the street and give them a chance in, in film game. And, it, you know, I, I went to Anna Scher's with the likes of Pauline Quirk, Linda Robson from Birds of a Feather, Phil Daniels, Gary and Martin Kemp from Spandau Ballet. Um, we all went there together and we were reaping the rewards of having this, these Cockney accents. You know, we all done lots of stuff together, films and then whatever. 
So, yeah, luck, I, I fell into the, into the game. Did you leave school with any qualifications, Ray? Did you? Because I mean, obviously, you, you know, you said you didn't really, you didn't like school. You hated it. Did you leave with anything? Not a thing. I, wow. I remember. I mean, I don't think it's a good thing. So, but we used to bunk off school all the time. Yeah, my mate. And some bloke used to let us into his pub. I mean, we all had school uniforms on. <laughs> no. And it, it, in the afternoon, we'd go down this, it was called the Duke of Bridgewater, which was on the canal. And we'd go around, and this, this guy had a really dodgy leg, limp, we used to let us in, play bar billiards, and serve us beer. And we, at that time, it was um, double diamond. So we were buying halves of double diamond. And what he didn't realise, we were paying for the beer and for the bar billiards, at, from the bar billiards, because we worked out at the hacks or the bottom. Mm-hmm. and stick our hand in, you can get the money out and go out to the bar and pay for your beer. <laughs> Old Harold. But he should, if my dad knew, my dad would have went around and killed him. You know what I mean? But we, we, we were at that for a couple of years. And then when it comes to the exams, I was kind of forced to sit an exam, GC or whatever it is, I can't even remember. I had no interest. So all I've done in the time is draw a picture of Roadrunner because that's about the only thing I could draw at the time and I put that in and the teacher called me up he goes I'm going to give you half a point for the picture so I had nothing but I didn't care I didn't want anything I didn't want yeah. to go to university I wanted to be an actor and uh and that's the way it went and now retrospectively and I'm sure a lot of people say I wish I wish I'd have studied yeah you know yeah, yeah. I feel that I missed a, a big thing there but I didn't. You can't turn back time. And God's been good to me. You know, I made a living doing what I'm doing. Can't beat the university of life, though, mate. And I mean, you know, a fair, fair deal to you a good hand um, with, with a part of Eckersley in Scum, which I know a lot of my viewers and subscribers will, will have watched many, many times. And uh, it stood the test of time, a very graphic uh, film, a great script, and the making of a, of a few people who were in the cast. But what was it? What was it like? Because that that originally was a, a BBC television uh, film, wasn't it? And then it was remade for cinema. Yeah, we we had a, a double touch out of that because we'd done the original, and it was Billy Cotton was the head of the BBC at the time. And I, I, I don't know where they're coming from, right? We made a film for them. And it was gritty. So they mustn't have obviously read the script. Do you know what I mean? Because when Billy Cotton see it, he banned it. So they called it the Billy Co- Cotton Band Show, right? And he banned it. And it. They paid all that money. You know, we shot for weeks and weeks and weeks on this film. And uh, it was binned. And rather than sell the film to the likes of, I don't know, Universal or, or whoever t- took it up, they wouldn't do it. They kept it. So we had to reshoot the whole thing. Great for us because we got double bubble, you know, more money. And um, it was fun. Well, it was fun and hard to shoot. I mean, it, what you saw on screen literally happened on set because a lot, of, a lot of the kids in that film were not actors. And, you know, it was quite a dangerous environment to work in. Knives were taking off people going in. And we, I remember doing some riot scenes and it turned into proper fights. And we used to go home black and blue and it was freezing cold and it was a, a tough old job. But, you, you know, you do it. And I'm very proud to be part of that. And, of course, Ray Winston, you know, um, Phil Daniels. We, yeah, he's a, he's a food delivery, guaranteed. <laughs> um we, we were all in it together. And it, it was training ground, really. Good training ground. Great film. Has stood the test. Although the writer did come up with um, the idea of doing Scum 2, right? Which is kind of a good idea. But he wanted to do it when we're all older. Where are we now type thing, which was a bit ridiculous, I thought. I thought, no, stick the Scum 1, mate. Yeah. That, that's done Something it. Good test of time. Some things are best left alone. Um, I, I did a bit of research, Ray, and it's not often I do that when I do, uh, you know, do an interview with people, and especially with people who I know. But is it true you did a, a, an audition for, for Blue Peter as a presenter? 
Yeah, it is. Wow, because John, John Noakes, of course, who had his dog Shep. I mean, it's my era of Blue Peter. Um, obviously, left, and and there was a there was a vacancy. So, how did that come about? And you know, what 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 was the mindset behind going for a, a presenting role on one of the the kids' best TV shows at the time? I think at the time, modestly, if I can say, I was quite well known, right? Um, so I don't know what happened. They must have rung up the agent and said, "Would you like to come in?" And I thought, well, again, I thought, yeah, this could be like a steady little job. You know what I mean? It might be nice to do. But I went in and a bloody hell, what you, you, they put you on a trampoline, so you've got to be talking to someone. <laughs> While you're jumping up and down on a trampoline, I nearly fell off about four times and, you know, make things out of bloody sticky back paper. And you had to do all that on camera. So somewhere this footage exists, or I hope it's dissolved. <laughs> And in the end, I said, Ray, you know, you've done well. well I knew I did, right? And, uh, it was my accent. She dad goes, it's your accent. Now, if you think now, it's ludicrous. But then it was sort of plummy BBC accents. Uh, or, you know, a, a, a Northern, a John Noakesy fight. Cockneys were definitely a no-no. Absolutely a no-no. And um, that was my Blue Peter career come to an end. Day one. <laughs> in a way though I think there's always a reason for something you know there's always a reason and mine was I went on to do not bigger and better things but I went on to do stuff that I really enjoyed you know yeah rather than being stuck in and I think if I'd have done that as a presenter then you're labeled for life and I don't think you could have went on to be an actor after that yeah I suppose Peter Duncan done it in a small way but you know it's a difficult transition then now, of course, it's all different. It's all about celebrities and whatever. Yeah, of course it is. Um, yeah, I mean, you're talking about the old days, mate. The old days. Yeah, exactly. The list. I mean, the list of credits is, is fascinating. Um, although you've got the hair for us, um, you didn't play the lead role in Gandhi, but you, you doesn't matter how small the role is. To have that on your on your credits is, is amazing. And you were you were alongside Daniel Day Lewis as well. Yeah, uh, Daniel Day Lewis and a guy called Danny Peacock. And uh, see, again, in those days, it was great because we had equity. We were in, in, in a, a, an actor's union called Equity. And if you weren't in equity, you could not, you couldn't act. Sorry, this is my bloody... Alert from calendar. Cork about my funeral, sorry. Um, no not your the, funeral. And here's that ad, no, someone no, else's. Mine. I've got to go to <laughs> one, which would be a good Irish wake, I'll tell you after. But the, um, what was I saying? Uh, we're talking about Gandhi. Yeah, yeah, so you had to be in equity. So if you wasn't in equity, you couldn't do an acting job. And and you, you could it, it was like a, a sealed unit. It was great because we were getting paid great money. We were probably getting paid more then than what people get paid now. Um, it was protected. Everyone done their craft. Everyone was proper actors, you know, not celebs. It, it, it wasn't at that time. And... Uh, and when you worked, if you had to travel as far as India, we travelled, and remember, I was in bloody basically an extra in Gandhi, right? Um, first class, limousine to pick us up from the house to the airport, first class um, travel all the way to India, and you had to rest for a week in a hotel, sort of five-star-ish hotel, rest for a week, do your days filming and then have another sort of four or five days rest before you travel. That was union rules. So it was great and getting paid loads of money for it. And then, you know, Daniel wasn't as, you know, he wasn't the star he is now. And uh, we went out, we, it was a nice job to do, but we, we were in the bar all the time, by the pool with cocktails, you know, and then we got the hump when they asked us to do the day's work, you know, oh, bloody hell. Um, so that was it. It was a nice, nice job to do. And of course, I didn't know what Gandhi was. I didn't know it'd go on to be quite a, a, a big film. Um, so it is a good one to have on your CV, yeah, even though it was a cough and a spit. What was the most challenging role you took on? Because, I mean, you know, again, just going through your CV, um, you, you played a, a, a gay character um, in, a, in a sitcom. Uh, you played someone with special needs. Um, you know, was there any of these characters that you found particularly difficult as an actor? There was, there was one, right? The, the gay one in Dream Stuffing, that was very easy because it was written by 
to you know, a woman and a bloke both gay. And I said, look, I'm not going to camp it up. And they said, no, don't. Just be yourself. Be what you are. Because, of course, that's what that's right. That's the right way to do it. And I did. So I had no problem with that whatsoever. The one I did have a problem with, it was a, a BBC drama, one-off, one-hour play or whatever, called Mary's Wife, where I had to play a transvestite. And... I didn't mind that, you know, I thought quite a nice challenge. I'll get a bit of a ribbing from the boys in Islington about it. But the worst part, and I'll get why they've done it. At first, I thought they were taking a piss, but the director, when I went in for rehearsals the first day, handed me a, a pair of knickers and a bra, and I think they were pink, and said, you have to rehearse in these. Strip off, go out. You have to... And I, fuck me, I felt like going home. <laughs> I ain't doing that. But they were right, you know, after a week of rehearsing them, I didn't care. I, I didn't even forget myself sometimes, you know, and sort of want to pop out of the shops in my knickers and bra. Uh, <laughs> it got rid of all that sort of embarrassment and, yeah. and whatever. And so by the end, of it, I absolutely got it. But that was the most challenging. I nearly walked off the job because mm. I had to wear that. But now I, I look back, you know, with fondness of it. And that was quite a good play as well. And funny enough, I was dreading going into my local, all, all my mates. I was only young, really, in my 20s or whatever. And all my mates were kind of toughies. And when I went in there, they just said, fair play, Ray. Fair play, yeah. You've done it and you've done a good job. So that was nice, you know. You did a couple of episodes of Minder. Did you get a chance to work with the uh, the two legends in that show? Yeah, I did. Um, and, you know, you're in the trailer with them and you, you're talking to them. It's a little bit in awe of them because, obviously, it was a hugely successful show. But, again, those things, are, you just do for the money. You know, you're not doing it for any to advance your career or anything like that. You know, it's good profile to be in it. And you're just doing it for the, for the dough, really. And they were nice, nice enough. And Dennis Walton was a nice guy, you know, go out drinking and things like that. Um and to, to me, again, it's a job. And that's what I think people have lost that, you know, in this day and that. It's a frigging job, for God's sake. It's no different than being a painter and decorator. So I don't go in thinking anything other than, well, I'm going to get some money out of this. Do yeah. the job and go home and go up the pub. Uh, three, up, three up, two down again as well. I mean, you, you did a lot on that. And I mean, that was getting some great ratings in the days when TV was pulling in big rating, 17 million viewers um, yeah. for, for, for some of that. And you played a, a character called Nick Tyler um, yeah. in that. Well, I mean, that, that must have been a lot of fun working with likes of Michael Elphick and Angela Thorne. It, Angela Thorne, a darling. Michael Elphick, bit of an arsehole, to be quite honest, because poor Michael, he, he had a terrible drink problem. It killed him in the end, you know. Mm. And uh, he'd become a very different person as the series went on. He was great in series one, but he was he was going downhill fast. And by the time of the end, and working with Lizette Anthony was it was a joy. Um, the girls were great. Michael, he got a bit prickly with me, you know, a few times. And if he'd forget his lines, he'd blame me. <laughs> but he's pissed. And I remember once we were shoot, shooting down in Bournemouth. Um, you know, it was sort of an episode when we were by the seaside. And I invited my wife up. I said, come up and have a look at the filming. And it was a night shoot. And I said, well, after that, we'll go out and we'll have a bite to eat and stuff. So I got a scene with Michael and he kept forgetting his lines, but he started swearing at me. You know, I got fucking hell, Ray, you know, get your lines right and do that. So I offered him out because <laughs> my wife was in by the camera. So I offered him out. I said, come on in if you want it, you can have it. And it all calmed down. And he was never cheeky after that. But it, uh, it's a shame, and uh, his biography, I had to be honest with the biographer, I'd say the same thing in that. he become an arsehole. And, uh, you know, but it was a great show to do, huge profile, huge profile. And, and it, you know, great team to work with, the directors and the producers and that. And, of course, BBC, mate, what better brand can you, can you have? Again, it was luck. I don't know how I got that part, but it's... Just luck, you know. 
Yeah, you need a better look in this game. What made you go from being in front of the camera to being, being behind it? Well, simple reason being, you can't, or you couldn't, or I don't even think you can now, but you can't depend on acting as a, your main income, unless you're incredibly lucky, okay? So I was doing all right as an actor, but, you know, I had a, a, a child, my boy Sky came along, and I thought, you know what, I can't bring up a family worrying when, when the, the next job's going to come in. So I decided to go into the behind the camera, set up a production company, which <clears throat> I, I, I teamed up with Dominic Anciano, and we, I sort of, not bought into it, but I fell into Fugitive, which was one of the largest pop promo makers possibly in the world. You know, we've done all the biggest, Queen, Elton John, Tina Turner, George Mike, we've done them all. So that was going really well. And at that, in them days, you know, to do a pop promo, the top end ones, we were getting about 150 grand budget per vid. That's a three minute video. So you probably spend 50 grand and pocket the one. You know, it, it, those were the days, the, the 90s. But then um, TV companies dis discovered, hang on, why are we paying you, to, this is to the, the record companies, to show your, your videos when you're promoting your records? So no, you have to pay us to go on. And the budgets dropped from 150 grand you could get with the top bands to 15 grand, which made it unsustainable for us because we had huge overheads and we had lots of staff and which you needed, sign up with lots of directors and their entourages and we couldn't do it. So we decided, you know what, let's go and try and make a feature film. And um, there was a book knocking about called Profession of Violence, which was about the Cray twins. Um, and we thought, let's give it a go. Um, we contacted the craze through various, we were all, you know, got connections. And um, we went to see Ronnie. It was Ronnie Cray at first. And he said, I'd love you to do it. He said, but um, Roger Daltrey's got the rights, you know. So we wrestled the rights away from Roger Daltrey, got involved with the craze, which was a bloody nightmare, <laughs> tell you, dealing with them two. But um, we got the film made and the, the because I knew and went to drama club with Gary and Martin Kemp, by which time they were flying as Spandau Ballet, I said, they can act. These guys can act. I know they can act. Give them a chance. They're known internationally. Um, and we talked finance round to go in with it. And, you know, they've done a great job. And I think, you know, our old film made back in the 90s is much better than Legend, you know, that's just been made. I think it's... It's a better quality film. And I think the guys were superb. Stands the test and, of time, just like Scum does as, as, a, as yeah. a true crime film. And it Very was a different. great first, bound, you know, a great platform to launch my film career, you know. So you mentioned the careers, I mean, you, you know, and, and how difficult they were to work with. I mean, I can imagine Roger Dolby was quite happy to pass the book, but yeah. he was probably getting the same kind of grief. What was it like going to visit one of the most notorious criminals in Broadmoor <laughs> Hospital, Ronnie Cray? Well, we've right. To be honest, I had a nightmare the night before because I never met them, never knew them. I, I obviously knew the stories about them, and I had the weirdest nightmare that he kind of was crying and holding on the bars of a dark cell, and it was just a surreal dream. And I was very nervous when I went. I've, I've never been in the prison system before. I'm happy to say. Um, I don't like, and obviously you and I have been to see a lot of people in prison, but I don't, you know, it's horrible. The yeah. demeaning, getting searched and, oh. Uh, but we went anyway. And um, it was the old Broadmoor, the Victorian, you know, you, it, that's a film script in itself. It was really an old, like an old school. And uh, we were ushered through, done the searches, ushered through, to like an old school hall, a Victorian school hall with a stage. And on the stage were like paper trees and, you know, sort of background of a forest and things like that. And apparently I asked them, what's all that about? And then they were doing, um, the, the inmates were doing a play, Christmas play, Babes in the Wood, which I found a bit weird in, in, in 
you know, in it. So, and then my partner goes, oh, Ray, look behind you, look behind you. And I turn around, Yorkshire Ripper there, snogging Sonia Sutcliffe. And she was in the papers going, I don't want anything to do with him. You know, he's an animal, the man's a beast. And she's snogging him in, in, in front of us. And then in walked Ronnie, immaculately dressed, you know, all, all the VK, you know, on his shirt, the RK and gold watch and all that, because in Broadmoor, they let them wear whatever they want. And um, he was a lovely guy, very calm, you know, it was weird, some weird stuff, and, and my meets with Ron. They're not allowed to buy anything from the shop, but you can buy them stuff. So, and, and they'd have to consume it within the meat. They couldn't take it back to the cell with them. And at the time, he goes, uh, I said, Ron, what do you want? Would you want a cup of tea or what? He goes, no, I'll have a barbican. But get six, will you? Six barbicans. So I've got six barbicans. Two Mars bars, you know, three toffee crisps or whatever. And he sat and done a lot of them <laughs> within the hour. Because I don't know why. But I found out later the Barbicans were, the Barbicans used to, even though they were low alcohol, they had a tiny bit of alcohol, and it reacted with the medication he was on. So he was getting a buzz out of it. And they stopped it. They stopped all alcohol um, because of, of, of things like that. But again, I remember sitting there, with Ron, we we done the initial interview, got on well. We said you'd have to meet Reg, you know, but it's fine by me. And if I if I say it's fine, it's fine. And um, you know, Reg is another story. But the the end story with Ron, I remember telling him about Pete Sutcliffe. Oh, I was last time, you know, when I last seen this is in another meet. Last time I see him, he was snogging Sonia, and I see his face go red, and I saw. The other side of Ronnie Gray, I saw what people were terrified about um, back in the 60s. He went from a really amiable, lovely guy to goes, he, he what? He was snogging who? What? And he went red. He goes, I fucking do him. Cut in the paper about two weeks later. <laughs> the Yorkshire Ripper's got a scar like from here to here. And I am positive it was Ron done it. Positive. Yeah. Um, so, all right, we went then to meet Reggie Cray, and Reggie was a complete um, different bit of fish because he was pent up, you know, very aggressive. I, I felt uncomfortable, you know, um, very aggressive. <clears throat> well, you've got to remember, they're sitting in a cell all day. All they've got to do is think of the film. Well, I've got, you know, my family... I've got, you know, trying to get this film off the ground, doing other projects and things like that. But they wanted all the attention, which I weren't able to give them, you know. And it created tensions where he threatened my life, you know, Reggie. And in, in the guys were saying, you do realise I could put it in my will and have you killed. You know, well, how do you answer that one? You know what I mean? And then once I went and met him, I forget over in the Isle of Wight, it's bloody freezing in the winter. And I used to go suited and booted just because I thought that they'd like that, the craze. And they did. Because I remember it was freezing once and I went in a padded coat and jumpers and all that. And when I went in, he was fuming. And he goes, you're taking a piss out of me now. I said, why? He goes, look how you're dressed. You know, you're taking a piss. Because by this time, we had the rights and things. And um, he went, turned around and punched the wall. And the yeah, wall didn't come over, you know, and he said, then the visit. And I just said to him, I'm never coming to visit you again. That was great for me because it got me out. I said, I'm never going to come and visit you again. And uh, I didn't. I just used to deal with Ronnie. Ronnie was a dream to deal with because he was happy. He had his boyfriend, Charlie, in, 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 you know, in his cell. And he was happy. And he was happy where he was. Reggie wasn't, man. He was in a... In a Strange place. Did you have Remember any dealings with the? Did you have any dealings with the older brother, uh, Charlie? Yeah, I did. Charlie was a really nice guy, um, and uh, you know, so much so I went up when he got nicked. I went up um, to be a character witness for him in, in court, which they couldn't fit me in that day. And I'll give him a day. I said I'll do a day, but I can't keep coming up here all the time. Um, he was a diamond. Uh, uh, the brothers 
but I felt sorry for him in a way because the brothers treated him like shit. Um, you know, and say, don't talk to Charlie about anything. Well, you know, he's in the film, for God's sake. You know, you can't just ignore it. So I met him a few times. He, nice bloke. I, I don't think he liked the film. Um, well, none of them liked the film. Well, really? Oh, I went, I went to see Ronnie. I go, what do you think? And he goes, I hated it. I go, why? Because it's got big reviews and it's one of the top box office hits. There is, he goes, my mum never used to swear. <laughs> and that's all he cared about. Not forget cutting people's faces off. You know, it's about his mum swearing. I go, oh, sorry. But, you know, <laughs> Billy Whitelaw, man, you know, how bad is that? So they didn't like the film. And Charlie, because he was sort of ostracised by the brothers, because we were kind of under orders not to involve him at all, um, he boycotted the actual premiere and had his own, I felt sorry, I felt terrible. He had his own do, you know, premiere do down the road, but he just boycotted it. And um, I think he was out of order, but I, I had little choice, you know, I was under sort of orders really from the twins. One of the one of the scenes in there where, um, you know, Reg beats up a man and, and has him over the car actually involved somebody who shared a cell with Reg would create, Pete Gillette, who has since been jailed for horrendous uh, sexual yeah. offences. However... Yeah. Um, I've got to ask you the question. Um, was there, a, was there a, a part of that film where he, he was, you know, I think Charlie might have asked um, um, Martin Kemp, was it, to, to actually give him a dig? Because uh, Charlie didn't particularly like him, I don't think. Well, I don't know about that, right? But what I do know is none of us liked him. Um, he, we had to give him a part in the film because he's out, you know, Reg goes, give him. You know, I think it was Reg's boyfriend at the time, and, you know. Mm. Um, and we did, but he was driving us mad. He, you know, going, can you get me on top of the pops and all that? And oh, great singer, when my album's out, and his voice was terrible. Um, you know, it was just really frustrating. He was an all right guy, but he was full of himself, absolutely yeah. full of himself. So we give him a part in the film, but no one liked him. And, and the director, I know, and for, I. I was in Canada at the time doing another film and I popped back to see how it was all going. And um, the day Pete was was on set was when I wasn't there. And the, the director dubbed him in the final cut, he dubbed him. And um, so Pete Gillette sitting in the cinema waiting for his big moment, you know, and then, oh, what are you doing? But what's well, someone else's voice in his mouth? <laughs> he got up, stormed out crying and I sort of went out and I go, what's the matter? What's that? What? I didn't realise they dubbed him, right? <laughs> and he goes, I fucking dubbed my voice. They've cost Reggie time. This film's cost Reggie time. You know, you've grasped him up and off he went into the night. And that's what you're dealing with, you know, when you're doing these types of films. <laughs> you, you, um, you also did a, a film called The Wee Man, which of course was about um, Paul Ferris's uh, life. I mean, you know, what was what was it like working with with Paul on that film? Another film which, of course, launched helped launch the career of Martin Comston, who most people will know yeah. from Line of Duty. Yeah, a dream. I promised myself I would never do a gangster film again. It wasn't back the craze. It's just I was getting sick of it. You know what I mean? And at the time, I was living in France, and I kind of retired. Well, I was retired, and then. I buy a swimming pool. I'm showing off there a little bit, but buy a swimming pool. And my wife comes out with the phone and goes, There's someone on the phone asking for you. Hey, who is it? Who is it? It's like a Scottish man. So I took the phone and it's Paul. So somehow he got his that is spooky. He got my number. No one gets my number. And we, we we talked and he said, Look, I know you don't want to do gangster films anymore. Would you have a look at my book and documentary and whatever? We all knew the same people. I mean, like yourself, we, we're all, we know everyone's connected in a funny kind of way. So I, I looked, read the book and I thought it was a really good book and I'll have a go at it. And when I spoke to Paul, I said, I'll do it, Paul, but you've got to let me write it without any interference from you. And then I'll give you the script, have a read and see what you think. He read it and he thought it was spot on. He said, you know, it's as if you were there at the time. 
And the thing with dealing with Paul, Paul is an intelligent human being. And uh, dealing with the craze, they're thick as two planks. And Paul knows, he realises that it's an, what we're in is a business, a film business. There's certain things you have to do. You have to invent scenes in the script to win over audiences' empathy with the lead character. Because if you think about it, I'm trying to sell a film about Paul, and Paul had a very bad reputation at the time, you know, you know, tried for murders. He got off, agreeable. So I had to invent stuff like the dog, the famous dog scene, where he's a little kid and this gang kills his dog. And then he goes on to hate this gang and eventually gives them their comeuppance. That never happened. Yeah, it's the only thing. It, uh, we, Paul and I were doing lots of TV interviews. And rather than going, you know, Paul, you know, when five guys get murdered in a bar, you know, no one ever mentioned that. They just goes, what did you think when your dog died? <laughs> you know, and he had to smirk because he couldn't let on. It didn't happen. And he understood. He goes, Ray, I never had a dog. When he read the script, I said, yeah, I know, but this is why I'm doing it. So the audience feels sorry for you. So it's perfectly normal, perfectly acceptable you go out and scalp someone. And he did, because you did. You wanted that, this guy to get, get his comeuppance. And he saw that. And he, he really, really had... He, he didn't tread on my toes at all. A couple of times, he, you know, it's a film about his life and the people that respect him and he respects other people, even to the point of um, the... Uh, what's bloody... Arthur Thompson's mum in the film... I had her wetting herself and doing all that and being a pisshead. And Paul said, right, he, he goes, even though I detest the man, the, the, his grandmother or mother-in-law was never like that. And I can't condone you portraying her in that way in a film. And I thought, this guy's got morals, you know? So we, toned, we toned it down, you know what I mean? Um, it was a pleasure to work with Paul. And I've worked with him any time, in fact, Watch this space, folks. But the um, that that's the difference. You're dealing with someone who understands the industry. You're not dealing with people that are sitting in prison for 30 years, and this film's the only thing they've got, you know. One of my favourite films that you ever did was Love, Honour and Obey. It's become a cult classic, that. Um, and, you know, the, the likes of Jude Law, Johnny Lee Miller, Sadie Frost, starring in that film. Of course, Ray Winston, a good friend of yours. Um, is there going to be a love, honour and obey too? I think that's what everybody would love to know. I ain't saying nothing, Steve, because I know you know. So I'm not saying nothing. But again, watch this space. But, you know, think about the reality of it. It would have to be done, approached differently. You're never going to get that cast back together again. You know what I mean? Um, we're all too old. And um, everyone's gone their, their separate ways. That, when we first done Love, Honour and Bay, we were all knocking about with each other, going out drinking and having fun. And they, they'd done that as a, a favour, really, the film. Um, but I've got an idea, Steve. I've got an idea. So let's move on. I had, a I had the pleasure of working on uh, To Be Someone With You, which, um, you know, was... Uh, you know, just, I guess, refreshing for you to get back behind the camera. As you said, by your own admission, you'd spent a, a few years away in France, you know, contemplating retirement, but you you came back to do uh, what what the press had, you know, called Quadrophenia 2, which, of course, caused its own issues, mainly because a lot of the, a lot of the former cast from Quadrophenia were in it. But um, it was, a, from me personally, it was a hell of a lot of fun to work on. I was... Honoured to, to you know work for you and and to to be directed by you um, and and have a good little cameo part in that a good part in that and um, yeah I mean did you enjoy getting back behind the camera and working you know full time and being on the set? I, I, yeah, I, I enjoyed. It was a terrible tough time there. It was just pre pandemic, you know. And I'm going to be honest. I was working with. Um, sort of executive producers on the project that did not know how to make a film. You know, they're looking upon it like an accountant, an accountant, and it was stifling my creativity. 
So that side of it was going on. See, you as an actor wouldn't know that because I've got to deal with this shit, with this lot, and then come on and be all happy. All right, guys, you know, we're going to do scene one, thinking, I hope this lot are going to get paid at the end of the week. You know, it's terrible. So that, was, that wasn't nice. I enjoyed doing the film. I enjoyed the music. I think the film turned out okay in the end. And it's unfortunate it was released too early, I think. We're not, still not out of the pandemic, and it got released. And there was backlash. See, at first, I wanted everyone to think it was Quadrophenia too, so I got all the press, you know, and it went around the world. We got world press. Massive backlash, there because it wasn't Quadrophenia too at all. It never was going to be. You never entered our head to do Quadrophenia too. Um, so then, of course, when the film goes out, all the quad lovers go, oh, it's nothing like Quadrophenia, you know, it's rubbish and all that. However, the film's doing extremely well. I, I just had a report the other thing, and it's just got an American deal. Um, you know, so it's doing all right, mate. Your, your face will be in America soon, boy. You should get over there, get a bit of work. <laughs> but, you know, it was, it, it was that was a tough one, and I was ill at the time. I don't know if you remembered, Steve. I, I do, was yeah. Coughing. I had the worst cough in the world. I'm sure it was COVID. Positive it was COVID. And that's before we knew about COVID. And then, of course, lockdown came and I had to edit, sort of illegally in lockdown, because I had to finish my film. And so you weren't allowed to go around people's houses, but I've got the edit around mine and we set up a studio in my house, an editing suite. And, and cut it. It, it, just the whole thing. It, if it was done in a beautiful summer with not working with arseholes, um, thinking they know how to make films, um, it would have been a very different story. However, I enjoyed the film, with great actors in it. I, I enjoyed working with the actors. It was the behind the scenes I didn't enjoy. So obviously, you know, hopefully we're hoping that this pandemic is is starting to even out. You know, I think we've gone into a period of, of herd immunity now, which means that, you know, things can start getting back to normal uh, to a degree as we knew it. Uh, you know, what what's in the pipeline? I mean, we've we've obviously been working quite hard on on Freddie Foreman's life story. You wrote the script a few years ago. Fred gave you the permission to do it. And, you know, that's that's bubbling away. We know. But what, what else have you got in the pipeline? Yeah, I've got quite a few projects in the pipeline. One we mentioned earlier, but I'm not going to say what it is. Um, the I've got one, Mr. Kiss, which is, again, it, it's more like a love on a bait. It's a, a comedy gangster, you know, not taking itself too seriously, but it's, it's about a subject matter that, that I, I think is really good. It's had a fantastic reaction from distributors and actors. Um so that looks like that. I'm looking to do it. It ain't going to happen in February now because of this. We're still not out of the lockdown. Um, but it, it will happen as soon as I can make it happen. I really want to do the Fred film. Um, and together, you and I, we've got to make that happen. Um, and I've got a couple of other things in the pipeline, you know. So hopefully it'll be busy. But it's just, you know, this is bad time for filmmaking. Number one, there's such a backlog of films that haven't been made, but the money's sitting there, you can't get crews. I've just done a documentary, XFM, about XFM, and I couldn't even get an editor. You know, I had a hard time getting an editor because everyone's working. You know, that's why you look at my films. They're all shot around wintertime because people are out of work and you get them, it's cheaper and, and whatever. At summertime, really, it's very difficult to... to get a quality crew because they're all busy, you know. So I don't know, it's going to be tough, but it, well, it's all doable. I've got people lined up, you know, but it is difficult times still. And again, what's going to happen with cinemas? I don't know. Yeah. Don't know. A lot of your films as well, you, you tend to have a cameo. Is that is that a bit of a, an Alfred Hitchcock in you, Ray? Some, look, some, I, sometimes I love acting, right? And then I'll get bored of it. I'm, I'm, I've got a very low attention span, you know? And I had, sometimes I love directing, then I get bored of that, you know? Um, so I'll try and mix it up a bit. So if I'm doing it, I think, oh, sod this. I like this film. I, I want to be in it as well. So it's not to be a Hitchcock about it. It's just I'm a, probably the only person in the world that would cast me in anything, 
you know. Um, so, yeah, I'll give myself roles in my own stuff. Why not? On my channel, I do a lot of football stuff. As, as you know, I'm a big Newcastle fan. Have you got a particular allegiance uh, to a football club? I Look, football doesn't interest me whatsoever, right? It just never has. However, I live in Islington. I live right by the Emirates Stadium. My son is an Arsenal fanatic. Um, you know, all my family was Arsenal. So, of course, I side with Arsenal. Saying that, I've got a really good group of mates and it's sort of half Tottenham, half Arsenal. Well, I like the banter and the ribbing each other and, and stuff like that. But, yeah, my allegiance is to Arsenal. But I'm not... I'll give or take you. I've got a friend, he's got a box over there and occasionally he invites me over and um, I'll go there because you get the dinner, you know, loads of wine. You haven't, sometimes I've been and never went out and watched the game. I'm just sitting in the dining bit, you know, watching it on the telly about five seconds later than what's actually happened on the field. And uh, that's what, you know, I enjoy it. But it shows my level of interest in football. Just finishing off, finishing off, anybody, you know, who watches this, who's thinking about going into an acting career or thinking about going into being a, a producer or a director, what kind of advice would you give them? I, look, it's tough out there. And I, my kids, I've never encouraged them to go into the film game. You know, my, my son started working behind camera with me on my films, but he's worked out, look, this you can't depend on it. You, you're in work one minute and then you're out of work with, you know, a year. Um, actors, you know, it's some regulated now with the actors and pay peanuts, you get monkeys, basically. And, and if you look at a lot of the, the stuff that's being made, people have never been trained in their life. All want to be celebrity stars, you know. Um, it's tough. I wouldn't say, it's a great life. I have a great life. It's going to be a great, perspective, different perspective. I could have quite easily gone down the dodgy route, um, like a lot of our friends have. Um, I was lucky enough to escape and go down the dramatic route. Um, if, you know, if you want to go behind the camera, you study, you know, go to film school and, and, and study your craft. Um, you know, as an actor, I think that's all changed now, as you well know, Steve. It's all, I don't understand this podcast stuff. I wish I did. It's all the YouTube and the YouTube stars and uh, a couple of my mates' kids. I didn't know they were YouTuber, you know, sensations. And uh, they're getting invited to all these events. And it's a thing I've got to look at because even though I've you know, probably got a few films left in me, times are changing, have changed. Formats have changed. People's attention spans have changed. Um, and it's throwaway. I mean... To be an actor now and make money, I, I can't see that. Unless you're really lucky, you know, you ain't going to make much money. Uh, I remember when they'd done El Dorado. This was the start of the rot. Right? They'd done El Dorado. And they offered my brother a part in it, one of the main roles. And he phoned me up laughing. He goes, you won't guess this. How much do you think they're offering a week? And I said, what? Well, don't know. I've got no idea. He goes 180 quid a week to go out to Spain. And then he goes, they'll give you one flight every three months to come back, pay for one flight, to come back and see family. He just told us that he laughed. He thought it was a joke. And um, people went on and done it. And look at El Dorado, for God's sake. Worst thing it's I've actually, ever seen in my life. It's actually getting a rerun now on some channel. Uh, I, the bizarre wow. thing about that getting completely off uh, track was that um, they actually had people speaking Swedish in it and people speaking German without subtitles. So you know, unless you can speak all these multi, if you, unless you are multilingual, you would have a, you would have trouble understanding the format. But yeah, bizarre oh. that bizarre. What uh, is that, that? Was the start of the rock. That's, yeah, that was the start of the rock. And, and now, you know, there are good actors out there. Don't get me wrong. Of course, there are. But some of them, you know, it's just they're famous for being famous. And I don't get that. Yeah, just you're right. I'm jealous. Last question. Um, out of all the projects you've done in front of the camera and behind, what is the one that gives you the most satisfaction looking back? Love, Honor and Obey. You know, it's, it, it's, uh, it's so lovely. That and Operation Good Guys. Yeah, that was great. 
Yeah, and it, it, they have become cult. And, and young people now found Love on a Bay and they found um, Operation Good Guys. It's nice going up the road and you get young kids, I call them kids, 16 year olds, 15, go, oh man, Love, Love on a Bay. And they're quoting scenes from it and scenes from the good guys. So they're too dear to my heart. Fantastic. Ray, as always, absolute pleasure. I'll be down in London very soon to come and have a bottle of red with you, mate. And uh, good, health, good health and good luck to you for 2022, mate. God bless you. God bless you, Steve.